T-Y-R-E. There we go. Well, let's see if we can find a map. All right, and then I'll put it up on the screen for you. Oh, of course. Yeah, that one will work. Oh, it actually talks about the stuff I needed to talk about. That's what we want. Perfect. Google is your friend, except for when it isn't. They want you to think that. That's right. All right. Oh, that's not going to work. Can't do it that way. Nope. All right, I guess we're just going to have to move around. Okay. No, this is close enough. This will work. Yeah. So what's a mole? Well, I had to find out what this mole was because we're going to talk about it. All right. So before we, yeah, before we look at the text, we're going to be in Ezekiel, what? 26, right. And I told Anne, hey, we're going to do three chapters. And then I, after I prepared the material, I'm like, no, we probably won't. <laughs> you know, because it's more of the same. Thank you. Yeah, right. Um, but we have some judgment against Tyre. Tyre is, this is, probably should actually do another map to show you kind of where it is on the map map. How about this atlas map? Let's do that. There you go. So you have Sidon, Tyre. These are coastal cities. There's Caesarea Philippi. Have we ever been there before? Nope. Yeah. And then there's the Sea of Galilee. So Tyre's over here, Sea of Galilee. This is Jesus' home base, Capernaum. Nazareth is over here, right? This is the, the Decapolis are on this side of the sea. Sometimes the sea is called... Gennesaret, also called oh, Tiberius, yes. Sea of Tiberius. Yeah, depends on who you want to ask, right? There's Bethsaida. You remember Bethsaida? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chorazin. Woe to you, Chorazin. Yeah. There's Magdala. Who's from Magdala? Yeah. Mary. Mary. That's right. Yeah. So you have Tiberius, and you have the Sea of Tiberius sometimes. All right. Um, so this is. There's Cana. We've been to Cana before. Yeah. So Tyre and Sidon aren't that far. Um, in the ancient world, I think probably the first time we have a significant encounter with Tyre is with the building of the temple under Solomon. Is that right? Well, that is a significant story because it's in Lebanon. Yeah, so this is Lebanon, and this is all forest, and that's where the, they get the cedar trees for the, for the temple, and they float them down the Mediterranean, right, all the way down to Jerusalem, and then have to carry them by land down there. Right, so that's what we're talking about is Tyre. But now that you've seen that, now this makes sense. All right, so there's the island, and then um, it never gets conquered until Alexander the Great. And what did I say on the sheet? 332 BC. So that's after um, after this book, which actually poses some challenges for us. And then over time, you know, because of climate change. <laughs> Uh, no, actually, actually, over time, they just moved more. They took what Alexander did, and they kept adding more and more earth. So now the city is connected to the mainland. It's not really, it's not a floating city out on its own. But Alexander had to do this because everybody else who had tried to conquer Tyre could not do it because he had to do it by boat. And, of course, they were master sailors being at sea. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes and try, he, holds, he holds its... Siege from the land for 13 years and still doesn't conquer it. I mean, a 13-year siege? Jerusalem was two years, <laughs> right? So then eventually Alexander the Great, who's a Greek, will come and conquer it by building a land bridge <laughs> and then, then breaching the wall, right? Um, by the way, sometimes when you talk about Tyre, then you also talk about the other little settlements along the coastland as well. So all the way down along here. Yeah, so the coastal Tyre was, was conquered by, by Nebuchadnezzar, all the coastal part of the town, but the island was not conquered until later. Yeah. So you can see the present coastland there where they added all that land, so it ends up just being a little, uh, what you call that? Like a peninsula, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, by the way, we should know where Sidon is because Sidon's going to get lumped in with Tyre. Tyre's the capital. Sidon often gets jumped into there. Both of these places Jesus visits. Really? Yeah. Do you remember? What, what happens? Tyre and Sidon. Who are the Tyre and Sidon people? Hmm. Hmm. 
Hmm. We're talking about miracles. All right, well, pay attention this summer. Watch for Tyre and Sidon. You'll, you'll hear about it. All right. So, uh, yeah, there we are. Proclamation against tires. Uh, good year and whatnot. <laughs> uh, before we get too far along, 26, 27, 28 all go together. Now, 20, 27 and 28 are kind of standalone um, and different. They don't have any date markings, so we don't know what's going on here. I suppose we have to ask a question. Why Tyre? Why have an accusation against Tyre? Because we spent lots of time on Judah, a little bit of time on Samaria. It was the oracle against Samaria, but most of it's been against Judah or Jerusalem. But why bring an oracle against Dorothy? Shh. Why bring an accusation and, or condemnation against Tyre? Yeah, they are Phoenician. That's right. Hmm. Right. All of the judgments of God are on the basis of what? Belief. Or faith. unbelief. Yeah, faith, belief, or unbelief, lack of faith. Right? Uh, does it matter if they're Jew or Gentile? No. No. Right? But by the same token, as we heard today... Today would have been one of those times where I would have reluctantly given you a little bit of an introduction before the Ephesians passage, because the reconciliation between the two is between the Jews and the Gentiles. I don't know if you caught that in the Ephesians text today for our epistle. Being brought together in the blood of Jesus is Jew and Gentile. Tyre, Sidon, and Jerusalem, Judah. Right. Now, in the ancient world, they tried all sorts of times to bring unity between God's people and the foreign nations. Right. Another time we hear about the Sidonians, the king of Sidon, his daughter marries the king of Israel. Ahab marries Jezebel. Right? That one, that's a match made in heaven. Or hell. Or hell. Right. Yeah. Um, so the Sidonian gods are brought in, and a lot of them are just Canaanite. By the way, that's a good way to talk about it. Tyre and Sidon are like the last remnant of Canaan um, that was, not, was never conquered. And never, you know, so it had never been part of Israel. Um, there, were, there were truces at times or allegiances, but like that marriage, but they were always Canaanite. So in the gospel, the woman, the Syrophoenician woman in one text is also called the Canaanite woman in the other text. In the parallel from Matthew and Luke, the, between the two of them, one is Syrophoenician, that's from Syria or Phoenicia, uh, Phoenicia, or she's called a Canaanite in the other. And like the Canaanites are supposed to be gone. Actually, Tyre and Sidon kind of stay always Canaanite. They never, they're the, what's left of it. So uh, even older enemies than the Philistines are the Canaanites. Those were the first to be conquered even before the Philistines. All right? And they never did. And so then they end up being a thorn in the side of God's people forever. Right? With their false belief and idolatry. All right. So that's why they, they're going to be brought under judgment for unbelief. Everybody's judged for faith or unfaith. Right? Regardless of what nation, nationality, language, Skin color, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Follow? All right. So we should read something. Let's read the first six verses. And it came to pass in the eleventh Stop. year, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, because Tyre has said against Jerusalem, Aha, she is broken, who was the gateway of the people. Now she has turned over to me, I shall be filled. She is laid waste. Therefore, thus says the, the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and will cause many nations to come up against you, as the sea causes its waves to come up. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her <laughs> and make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for spreading nets in the midst of the sea. For I have spoken, says the Lord God. It shall become plunder for the nations. Also her daughter, villages which are in the fields, shall be slain by the sword. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. All right, so we have a little bit of a historic problem. So Ezekiel prophesies against Tyre that she'll be conquered, <laughs> right? Clearly, destroying the walls. And he's talking about the island, the island city, capital city. 
Uh, now, Nebuchadnezzar does conquer the villages, which are in the fields, right? So the, inland, the, the land-based Tyre. But the island he never conquers. He's not able to, right? So now the question is, well, is Ezekiel then a false prophet? Because he prophesies it, and then he's going to actually name Nebuchadnezzar here in a moment. And Nebuchadnezzar isn't the guy who does it. So does it actually matter? Does that matter? Okay, what Ezekiel prophesied is accomplished. It's not accomplished by Nebuchadnezzar, who he names by name here in a minute, but it is still accomplished. So the judgment comes. Uh, I, sometimes Bible people, they look for, they look for mistakes, right? Because then they can say, well, the Bible's not trustworthy. Because Ezekiel didn't quite get it exactly right, as far as the actual historic data. Yeah. All right. And we talk about sometimes these oracles are less explicitly historical and more, what do you want to say, metaphorical, I guess? Like, like Revelation. Like, yeah. oh, those and this, this definitely is true when you get to Ezekiel 28. So when we two chapters forward, um, that third oracle against Tyre, it's clearly a metaphor. It's not, because he, basically the king of Tyre becomes a type or a shadow of Satan himself, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Right, it tells us actually a lot about, um, gives some backstory to what Jesus talks about in the gospel. All right, does this bother anybody? It doesn't bother anybody? A little. Okay, a little. all right, fine. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. Does it bother you? No. It doesn't? No, because God does it. Yeah. I'm not as concerned. Well, well, why, why say it then? You know, why name Nebuchadnezzar? Right. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe it's this way. Um, so you see something on the horizon, right? God gives you to, in this case, he gives him to see forward to what's going, right? But it's because it's on the horizon, he sees Nebuchadnezzar. And so he's, that's Nebuchadnezzar is the one who's going to do it. But he doesn't see that just over the horizon is Alexander and he's the one that finishes it. So in a sense, Alexander is hidden behind Nebuchadnezzar. So he names Nebuchadnezzar, but from Nebuchadnezzar through to Alexander, it'll finally be accomplished. Maybe. Yeah, why, why the explicit name? Because we haven't had Nebuchadnezzar always named. We had to kind of like fill in the gap and come up with some historic data. Yeah. All right, well, it's just, yeah. it's a thing that people will point out, so I'm just pointing it out to you. All right, now the judgment. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring against Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, King of kings with horses and chariots, and with horsemen and a host of many soldiers. He will kill with the sword your daughters on the mainland. He will set up a siege wall against you and build a mound against you, and raise a roof of shields against you. He will direct the shock of his battering rams against your walls, and with his axes he will break down your towers. His horses will be so many that their dust will come. You. Your walls will shake at the noise of the horsemen and wagons and chariots when he enters your gate as men enter a city that has been breached. With the hooks of his horses, he will trample all your streets. He will kill your people with the sword, and your mighty pillars will fall to the ground. They will plunder your riches and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses. Your stones and timber are in the soil. They will pass into the midst of the waters. And I will stop the music of your songs, and the sound of your lyres shall be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock. You shall be a place for the spreading of nets. You shall never be rebuilt. For I am the Lord. I have spoken, declares the Lord God. Let's just keep going. Thus says the Lord God to Tyre, Will not the coastlands shake at the sound of your fall, when the wounded groan and slaughter is made in your midst? Then all the princes of the sea will step down from their thrones and remove their robes and strip off their embroidered garments. They will clothe themselves with trembling. They will sit on the ground and tremble every moment and be appalled at you. And they will raise a lamentation over you and say to you, How you have perished, you who were inhabited in the seas, O city renowned, who was mighty on the sea. She and her inhabitants imposed their terror on all her inhabitants. Now the coastlands tremble on the day of your fall, and the coastlands that are on the sea are dismayed at your passing. For thus says the Lord God, When I made you a city laid waste, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I bring upon the deep over you, and the great waters cover you, then I will make you go down with those who go down to the pit, to the people of old, and I will make you to dwell in the world below, among ruins from a bowl, with those who go down to the pit, so that you will not be inhabited. But I will set beauty in the land of the living, 
I will bring you to a dreadful end, and you shall be no more. Though you be sought for, you will never be found again, declares the Lord God. Oh. That almost sounds like uh, Atlantis at the end. Exactly. The, I, the island city that is lost? Huh. Huh. But you'll never be found again. Well, we did find it. Mauritania. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Finding Atlantis. You knew that? No, you didn't know that. Oh, some of you knew that. All right. So um, here, like I said, they bring that. He says Nebuchadnezzar is going to come against you. And that's where it gets confusing because it's like, then Ezekiel describes, maybe just didn't know geography. <laughs> right? No, this is not true. He knew Tyre. You, he describes doing a land-based siege against an island city. It doesn't make any sense. There's not, you can't use battering rams with boats, right? You can't set up siege walls, you know, and towers and horses. They can't, like, none of it makes sense. It will make sense with Alexander once he builds that, that uh, what they call it? The mole. Yeah, which I guess is like, I think of like a burrowing mole, but it's kind of like that, right? I want to call it mole. But anyway. Yeah. But anyway, regardless of whether it was actually Nebuchadnezzar, it wasn't, or it was Alexander, this prophecy against Tyre is accomplished just the way it's described. Um, and as is recorded in the historian, did I give you the name who recorded it? Probably not. It's probably Josephus. Did I write that down? Yeah, yeah I did in the first paragraph. Yeah. So... Um, and then we're going to see similar things happen with Egypt. So Egypt will be the other source of uh, destruction. Uh, I didn't think we had to spend too much time on it because you're like, okay, that sounds like a siege with horses, wagons. There's not a lot of like, what's the theological emphasis here? <laughs> um, notice though, I do think it is worth noting the kind of things we could say the king of Tyre uh, or the Tyre people trusted in. Because the way that God's judgment goes, it goes, the judgment goes against the things you trust in, right? Because those are the objects of your unbelief. Yeah, so we have all sorts of things here, right? Um, the fields, the, the walls, you trust in your walls as a defense, right? Um, your towers, you, let's see what else. Your gates, um, your people, maybe, right? Then we have, yeah, what you buy and sell, your plunt, your riches, your pill, your... Um, Houses, um, even your protection by water, the sound of your songs, etc. Right, and that you're on a rock. I mean, they're literally the house built on the rock in a sense, but they're not well, built they, on they, faith they, in Christ. I think yeah, so they mean rock. yeah, that's that's what Tyre means in Phoenician. It means rock. So there, you might think, oh, maybe this is what I I made this comment a few times now for you, but I I'm coming to realize that a lot of what Jesus speaks of in the Gospels. <laughs> It doesn't quite have its richness because we don't know this book. Yeah. Woe to you, Tyre and Sidon. I mean, he actually does that. So you're like, wait a minute. So then we're supposed to think, what a, did the prophet ever preach against Tyre and Sidon? Oh, we should go look at that. Well, here it is, right? Now, in this case, when Jesus talks about, you know, the house built on the rock, you're supposed to think, is there a coastal city or, you know, built on a rock? Because not Jerusalem. I mean, it's built on a hill, but... It's not, there's no waters coming against Jerusalem. It's too far inland. So what's he, what city is he thinking? I want you to think of this city, right? And then unlike that city, who could not be saved because they were even on a rock, um, actually it was a land bridge made out of sand that, got, <laughs> that ended up being their destruction, ironic. See, that, that's like a, a background to when Jesus talks about build your house upon the rock. Because when he means rock, he means himself or faith in him, right? They built themselves on a literal rock, but not on faith. Follow? Yeah, yeah. So again, we can apply it. Um, and so it's never gonna be again rebuilt. I don't know if there's historic background to that. I mean, there is a modern day city, but as far as what it was, all right? And then, then things get interesting, all right? So everybody's starting to cry and to wail at the sound and then they're wearing these robes and embroidered garments. Huh. So um, we talked about this this morning with the ladies because they didn't um, necessarily know the, the, what happened to baptism after the Reformation. That many of the city-states or nations that became Lutheran in particular, but Christian in general, 
Um, they use baptism not as a washing, rebirth, and renewal by the Holy Spirit. It brings one into the church, makes one a child of God, grants the Holy Spirit. That was all true, but then they added this provisio. It also made you a citizen of the nation. And then ultimately that became more important. You want to be a citizen so that you get all the benefits of being a citizen, then you're baptized. Never mind faith, never mind God's word. Right? And did great damage to baptism, especially amongst the Scandinavians. Still to this day, because they still have it. Well, I think Sweden got rid of theirs just in the last five, ten years. Um, but I think Norway and Finland still have Lutheran state church. And citizenry and baptism, baptism go together. That's how you become a citizen, is by being baptized. That's like a carrot and a stick problem. Baptism is supposed to be a gift, not an obligation, in order to be a citizen of your nation. <laughs> right. Um, we have a similar thing happening here with Tyre, because they're dressed like they're priests. They're dressed like they're priests. So, as is often true, the, the, the high king is also the high priest, which is, turns out to be a mimicry of, of Jesus in a way, right? Jesus being the prophet who speaks God's word, and our priest who offers himself as a sacrifice, and of course our king who rules over us by his word, Right? All right, only Jesus can fill all those offices. Um, and even for Israel, that was true. That there were times, um, I think I gave you the story on here somewhere maybe. Mm, who knows? It's in Numbers. or Yeah, it's in Numbers. There's a story, uh, I didn't put it down, where, um, where Aaron rebels against Moses. So Aaron gets confused. He's the high priest, but he's not Moses. He's not the prophet. And he usurps Moses, and uh, things do not, do not go well. God is angry, <laughs> right? In other words, stay in your lane, right? God calls you to be high priest, you're a high priest. Calls you to be prophet, be prophet, right? And later he calls kings to be kings, but sometimes the kings get confused. And the kings then set up false worship, try to be priests. And then that's when all sorts of idolatry and rebellion comes on. So it sounds like the king of Tyre is doing that, and we know he does, because his daughter, for example, in ancient times, brought all her gods with her, because her father was the priest. Right? Makes sense. All right. Yes? No? Makes sense? Yes? Okay. I can talk at you. It's fine. <laughs> then all the princes of the sea will come down from their thrones, lay aside their robes, take off their embroidered garments, clothe themselves with trembling, lay on the ground, tremble every moment, and be astonished at you. So even all the other coastal cities are going to weep and lament at what, the great downfall of Tyre, right? Oh, you have perished, oh inhabited. This sounds like a, we should, you need a, like a shanty song, right? With the, when the seamen come back to the, to the port and they're all singing their songs in the bar, right? Oh, inhabited by the sea, fairy men. Oh, renowned city who was strong at the sea. She and her, right? That's what it is. Okay, good. She and her inhabitants who caused their terror to be on all her inhabitants. No, oh, now it's a lament. Now the coastlands tremble on the day of your fall. Yes, the coastlands by the sea are troubled at their departure. Oh, how great was Tyre, and now you, the mighty have fallen. Right, so we have, we have a little lament here from the, uh, from the sailors in the midst of the... That's kind of fun, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know what more you need to say about that. She was a terror, but now she is ter ter terrible. Yeah, or terrified. All right. But, of course, we're talking, it's not their lament. It's by the word of the Lord, right? For thus says the Lord God. All right, so now we have, I said, the king of Tyre ends up being kind of a type or a shadow of Satan which will come up later in the next couple chapters. But we see it foreshadowed here already because we get the language of hell. We don't know that much about the pit or Hades or Sheol or hell, right? Um, by the way, Hades is Greek. Sheol is the place of the dead in Hebrew, right? The pit is the equivalent to hell in Hebrew, whatever it is in Hebrew, whatever the word is. All right. Yeah, like Gehenna. Well, Gehenna is different. That's the, the valley of Henna, right, with all the... It's the, it's the dark that ends up being synonymous with hell. Outside of Jerusalem. All right, all right. I said I should know what the Hebrew is. It is Bor, also known as a cistern. Pitfall. World of the dead. Oh. Oh. Your wife is a boar. She's a, she's a pit. Okay. Anyway. 
Apparently it's used for that too. <laughs> I'm not a pit, I'm your wife. All right, anyway. All right, so he's going to go down into the deep. Of course, that's with water, right? Oh, yes, great waters cover you. Bring you down with those who descend into the pit. So remember, as Jesus says, the, de- the hell was prepared for you? No, for, for the devil and his angels. All right. Um, but here we have the city going down into the pit to a place prepared for the devil and his angels. Right. So does God want you to go to hell? No, I didn't even make it for you, which is incredible, right? It's, right, but it, but it wasn't for you. You're only there if you follow after Satan. So you have this sense of they're deceived and they follow the deceiver to the place prepared for the deceiver, right? Yeah. Bring you down with those who descend in the pit, but to the pe- people of old. But then, then you have Dante come in. You wonder where Dante gets this stuff, right? I will make you dwell in the lowest part of the earth. Right? So we have, you know, Dante has the different levels, right? All right? So he goes into the lowest level. So that's why I say he's a type of, of Satan. That's who's at, in Dante, is always, already down at the very bottom of the pit, right? But those who go down to the pit, you will, so that you'll never be inhabited, I shall establish glory in the land. What did you say? Beauty? Yeah, you said beauty. In the land of the living, I will make you a terror and you shall be no more. Though you're sought for, you'll never be found again. So we also think last week, I had one of our uh, members ask me, um, who hadn't, I don't, hadn't really thought too much about the gospel text, I guess, because he said, wait a minute, so there's no bridge between heaven and hell? No. Right? Because that, that Jesus said, with the, there's a chasm fixed between you and they, so that you cannot go there and they can't come to you? Right. So you have the same idea. You try to go bring, try to bring Tyre back up from hell, you can't. It's, there's a chasm, it's fixed, right? You can't ever find it again. So we see that in the background there too. But this, I will establish glory or beauty in the land of the living. Because re- what it sounds like was happening is that Tyre was putting all their trust in their beauty, their garments and their houses and their big walls and being surrounded by the ultimate moat, right? The actual Mediterranean Sea and, you know, and their wealth. They were quite wealthy. With, that, with those ports, remember those ports? Did you see them? Where was it? You have the Sidonian Harbor and the Egyptian Harbor, right? So talk about, like this is perfect, right along the sea there. They trusted in these things, and what happened to the things in which they trusted? They're done, right? This is always a problem with idolatry, isn't it? I'm trying to think there's a, is it, is it a scripture or is it a hymn? Hmm. Some trusted in wealth or riches. Some trusted in, I think it's a hymn or maybe it's a scripture. All this stuff muddles together. My, my uh, ADDH, you know, adult brain, I guess. All right. So we, well, today we heard about it, right? We, trust not in princes, they are but immortal. Yeah, right. Or trust not in riches. Moth and rust decay and destroy, right? We'll hear all these things this summer, right? In our text today, they, try, they thought what was more important than faith in God. I've got a field. I got my new John Deere tractor, right? With all of its horsepower. And then I got, I got a wife. I got kids. I got family things, right? Father's Day. I didn't, I didn't push the button on that one. I thought about it, but... <laughs> All right, good so far? Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of a general oracle of judgment. Any more specifics? All right, let's lament. More. Let's keep going. 27. We started a little early? Yeah, we did. So we can finish a little early. Go. The word of the Lord. This one won't take too long. It's basically the same thing again. Nobody want to read? All right, Mike. Yep. 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 The word of the Lord came again. You who are situated at the entrance of the sea, merchant of the peoples on my coastlands, thus says the Lord God. O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Your borders are in the midst of the seas. Your builders have perfected your beauty. They make all 
your planks of fir trees from Sinuah. They took a cedar from Lebanon to make you a mass. Of oaks from Bashan they made your oars. The company of Azurites had mm -hmm. inlaid your planks with ivory from the coast of Cyprus. So you got the deck of the boat with ivory inlays? Ooh, that's special. Keep going. Seven. Patrick, James, James, you're blocking the screen. Sit down. Fine embroidered linen from Egypt was what you spread for your sail. Blue and purple from the coast of Elisha. 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 Yeah. Was what covered you. Inhabitants of Sidon and Arved were your oarsmen. James. Your wise men, O Cairo, were in you. They became your pilots. Elders of Jabal and its wise men. Sit down. You're blocking the screen. Were you were you in you were in you to cause your seeds, all the ships of the sea, and the oarsmen were in you to market your merchandise. Those from Persia, Lydia, and Libya were in your army as men of war. They hung shield and helmet in you. They gave splendor to you. Men of Arved with your army were on your walls all around. And the men of Gamad were in your towers. They hung your shields on your walls all around. They made your duty perfect. All right, well, I guess we can hold up there. Um, so I, I've alluded to this a few times, but now you see it explicitly, right? The kind of things they trusted in. I mean, it really sounds incredible, these ships. I wonder if we have any of these. It'd be something to go see if we can... If any of this stuff's extent, I mean, they're, it's so extravagant that they're using embroidered linen from Egypt for their sails. Like, it, you know, we, we can't even afford to have it on our bed for bedspread, right? And then they're putting it up as sails. And they're blue and purple, which you know is expensive dye, right? You've heard that many times. Um, yeah, that's incredible, right? And then you're getting all these excellent pilots. You even take your, your wise men and making them the pilots. We're in you to, wait, the wise men are the cock to cock your seams. So you're taking these, I mean, you've got such a wealth of, of wisdom that you can put them to work at the most menial tasks. You've got so many intelligent people, but they're just cocking the boat because, yeah. You could say you could trust in that, like we're, we're the city on the hill kind of thing, right? That's the expression. You know, we're so smart. We're so much more intelligent than people used to be. Although I always point this out um, when we talk about education, which is something we need to probably talk more about, in that uh, um, the reading level of an eighth grade graduate today is equivalent to like second or third grade <laughs> 100 years ago. Like we're, we think, oh, we're so smart and intelligent. We're really just kind of morons. So, I, I include myself in that. Yeah, so like, like honors high school level, like AP level English proficiency in high school, like college, you're already college proficient, really, right? AP is, was an eighth grade reader in our school 100 years ago. So, uh, yeah, you could trust in like, oh, look how smart we are, but even that's a little deceiving is the point, right? Oh, we have all this technology, yeah. Until the power goes out. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you all know this. Mm -hmm. I read so. the other day that, that uh, GPA scores are going up, but the SAT scores are going down. <laughs> well, and they do. And they, SAT is as bad as government statistics because they change the scale all the time. So, like, my whatever it was, 1350, because I was so smart, you know, today is like 1800 and it doesn't even go that high. You didn't even take it. There's no point. You're just, yeah, you don't need to be told how smart you are. Yeah, they, they, they adjust the scale. Sliding scale. All right, anyway. From Persia, Lydia, and Libya, there's people all over. Men of war, shield and helmet, splendid, right? They're probably even like inlaid. They, their shields normally are cloth covered. They're wood with cloth on the outside. So they probably, you know, even put that fancy stuff on their shields on the walls, and look at what they're trusting in, your beauty, right? But of course, as, uh, as the apostle says, the, you know, the thing that had glory, referring to the law, now has no glory at all in the gospel, right? Now, if the law has no glory in the light of the gospel, what about the things we glory in <laughs> that we make? They never had glory in the first place, even though we thought they did. 
Um, although, I do follow some uh, social media feeds that uh, highlight architecture and art, like, like marble carving. Have you seen like the Italians where they could carve, like looks like translucent fabric, but they're, it's not, it's just solid stone. But, or even I saw a thing about David and somebody got upset with, uh, was it Michelangelo that did David? Yeah. Got upset because he's missing a muscle on his back. And Michelangelo you know, said that there was a defect in this stone because it was a defective piece of stone that they couldn't use for building that he used for the carving. He's like, I couldn't car that was I had to leave that out because there was a defect in the stone. But that like there were other people that noticed that not every muscle was present. Granted, and he did that at like twenty he started that when he was twenty five, I think. Something like that. Yeah, he was in his twenties. Just Yeah, and we're so impressive. So I reposted um, a, a Twitter where it was, it was a cathedral. It was a long, like, I think it was English cathedral with its span ceiling, you know? And, and the guy, a guy responded, he said, my dad's an architect. He says, we have no idea how to build that today. We can't. We don't even know. We're like, wait a minute. Like, you couldn't do that? Some of it's economic, probably. But it's like, but it's time is really what it is. They're unwilling to take the time, 60, 70, 80, 100 years to build something because it takes multiple generations, right? right? Or to dedicate your life to one thing, carving marble. Now Michelangelo was a polymath, because he painted too, right? Yeah. But maybe we're not so concerned about the finished product and how good the product is, but just having it right away. Yeah, because you get your furniture at Ikea. So when it breaks, you throw it out, right? This is no good. Wasn't even good in the first place, right? People do this with houses, right? They build the house, then they tear it down and build a bigger one. Without steel. And then they sign off on it, but nothing really they couldn't really do the work out engineering wise. Right. I think it's at Johnson Blackstone. Oh right. Yeah. The, we had a we had a Frank Lloyd Wright house in the, in Lafayette where I grew up, uh, West Lafayette. And they've had to do a couple let's go back and fix the problems. Yeah. Well, because they had they had uh, inlay you know floor heat and then it breaks. And you're like, well, but it's in the concrete now. <laughs> And then you got to get it all up again. And... But those cathedrals, unless there's fire or something, right? Put a new roof on periodically. Yeah. Like, and, and tuck pointing, of course, for masonry. But these are all things that we still know. Anyway, they're trusting in their beauty, but what is that going to, how, how beautiful is it when coming up against the glory of God? All right, Tarshish, we'll keep going. This is, the, like I said, we don't have to, there's not a lot of theology here. Tarshish did business with you because of your great wealth of every kind. Silver, iron, tin, and lead, they exchanged for your wares. Yavon, Kubal, and Meshach traded with you. They exchanged human beings and vessels of bronze for your merchandise. Ah, uh, slavery, there we are. And based Togo, Togoma, they exchanged horses, war horses, and mules for your wares. The men of Dedan traded with you. Many coastlands were your own special markets. They brought you in payment ivory tusks and ebony. Which Syria. means you got long trade routes, right? Yeah. For ivory. Syria did business with you because of your abundant goods. They exchanged for your wares emerald, purple, embroidered work, fine coral, and ruby. Judah in the land of Israel traded with you. They exchanged for your merchandise wheat of minute, meal, honey, oil, and balm. Damascus did business with you for abundant goods because of your great wealth of every kind. Wine of Helvin and wool of Sahar. My favorite. The Sahara. And white wool. It could be white wool. And casks of wine from Saul. They exchanged for your wares. Wrought iron, cassia, and palmas. They bartered for your merchandise. Dedan traded with you in saddle cloths for writing. Arabia and all the princes of Kedar were your favorite dealers in lambs, rams, and goats. Hmm. In these they did business with you. The traders of Sheba and Rama traded with you. They exchanged for your wares the best of all kinds of spices and all precious stones and gold. Haran, Kaneh, 
Eden, traders of Sheba, Asur, and Kilmad traded with you. In your market, these traded with you in choice garments, in clothes of blue, and embroidered work, and in carpets of colored material, bound with cords and made secure. The sits of Tarshish traveled for you with your merchandise, so you were filled and heavily laden on the seas. Your rowers have brought you out into the high seas. The east wind has wrecked you in the heart of the seas. Your riches, your wares, your merchandise, your mariners, and your pilots, your coffers, your dealers in merchandise, and all your men of war who are in you with all your crew that is in your midst sink into the heart of the seas on the day of your fall. At the sound of the cry of your pilots, the countryside shakes, and down from their ships come all the hand of the oar. The mariners and all the pilots of the sea stand on the land and shout aloud over you and cry out bitterly. They cast dust on their heads and wallow in ashes. They make themselves bold for you and put sackcloth on their waist, and they weep over you in bitterness of soul with bitter mourning. In their wailing, they raise a lamentation for you and lament over you. Another lament within the lament, right? Who is like Tyre, like one destroyed in the midst of the sea? You're supposed to do it like the sea song. Never mind, no, don't do it. I'm trying to make it sound very sad. When your wares come from the sea, you satisfy the many people. With your abundant wealth and merchandise, you enrich the kings of the earth. Now you are wrecked by the seas in the depth of the waters. Your merchandise and all your crew in your midst have sunk with you. All the inhabitants of the coastlands are appalled at you, and the hair of their kings bristles with horror. Their faces are convulsed. The merchants among the peoples hiss at you. You have come to a dreadful end and shall be in your earth forever. All right, so you see... Yeah, this is like taking that little lament in 26 and then just blowing it up, right? Making it a lot, even more significant in that. There's a lot of history in the uh, trades. Here. Yeah, and that, that, I mean, that's a helpful note. I, I run up against this just in my, even my own thinking, because I'm, you know, I'm indoctrinated by public education. So, um, or at least, you know, in high school, college, kind of. Well, I went to one of our schools. I think all of our schools have been, we have this, we have this view of history of, um, this is what uh, C.S. Lewis calls chronological snobbery. That, you know, chronological in time, that, that we are superior to the people who came before us. That's why I mentioned what we saw before, right? But even, we're like, oh, well, you know, we have impressive boats and, you know, trade routes and look at the Suez Canal and right all the ships that go through there. And like, this is, Roughly, what, 3,000 years ago or so, thereabouts, 2,800 years ago. And they have extensive trade routes. Maybe they're not as efficient as we are with their, because we have our trains and our planes and our automobiles. Um, but I, I could, it's, it's like lions, tigers, and you have to say bears, right? Uh, we, have, we have all of our transit, we have all of our mo multimodal, you know, shipping capacity and so we can move a great number of goods. Okay, that's true. But that doesn't mean that like we're superior we, if we're more efficient at it. These, I mean, these, they're not burning fossil fuels to do it. <laughs> so maybe they are superior. Hmm. Climate change. Uh, yeah, right. But also, um, I mean, it is true. I know this for like with coffee, for example, is that coffee doesn't make it into Europe until our around the time, actually after the Reformation. Luther didn't have coffee. There was no coffee. I want to say, I'm pretty sure, yeah, like Columbus actually discovered coffee. No, but anyway, <laughs> big, big, well, because coffee comes from North Africa or south of the Saudi Peninsula, depending, they argue about who was the originator. When did it get to Europe? Uh, well, Bach talks about it, but that's 100 years after Luther. So it's somewhere, I mean, it's different parts of Europe, but like Germany didn't have it until the mid 16th or late wow. 16th century. Yeah, maybe early 20th, 17th century. That's weird because when I was in Germany for the first time, I went back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. I thought their coffee was fantastic. Yeah. Like better than here. Yeah. At the time. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I mean, they have it before we did yeah. here, but there was no here at that point. So right. <laughs> that, was, that was later too. Well, remember the, remember the colonization of, of the Americas was largely about trade routes from East India, right? Yes. We wanted to get, we wanted to get things from the, from the Pacific, what we now know, all the way to Europe. And, so, and then they discovered there's all sorts of resources here they could cannibalize and send to Europe. Right. 
All right, so, um, yeah, that, that's just the point. The point is, they trusted in all these things, but what happens to them? Yeah, it's all, they all go down to the bottom of the sea, right? Or to the pit, if you prefer, according to the last chapter. And then all, all the nations weep and lament over them. Because, you know, it's like pride, right? Um, how great the fall, you know, this greatest of cities, and then it's a, lot, it's a lot farther down, isn't it? No humility is kind of the point, too. And there, you know, sometimes people, some of the biblical, biblical scholar people say that this chapter doesn't even really belong in here because you notice who's missing. Uh, I'm going all the way at the beginning. It starts, thus says the Lord God, and then we don't hear anything remotely religious or godly ever through the rest of the lament. So they're like, eh, somebody added this in later. Well, maybe, but, but the point is, um, trust not in riches <laughs> or how impressive your city is. Oh, oh, you have the, you have the reserve currency of the world. Uh huh. You have the biggest boats. You have space planes, right? I'm thinking of all the world empires. Have I, recomm I recommended this to you before. The Do Ray Dalio has a video. You can watch it on YouTube where he talks about the rise and fall of empires as an economic thing. Ray Dalio, he's an investor guy, but he, you know, I'll have to link it sometime. But he, he thinks that you can trace um, the rise and fall of every empire, ancient to modern, based, whether it's British or Roman or even the U.S. empires, the last one, uh, we are an empire, based on the valuing of currency. The value of currency based off of raw, and then devaluing it and printing or minting too much, and then another empire takes over. And I think he makes a pretty compelling case. All right. Hey, we got time. Maybe we are going to do it. You think we can do it? All right, we're going to do it. This one, this is a crazy chapter. I think you'll, you'll like this one more than the, first, the last two. Okay, I'll read it. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre. So now we're directly addressing the prince. Thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am God, a God. I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas. He's a Poseidon or something, right? Yet you are a man and not a God, though you set your heart as a heart of, God, of a God. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. I don't know if it's sarcasm or not. You are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself. Notice who's the subject of the sentence here. It's all about you, 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 yeah. Not God, you. And gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom and trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. You, 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 you. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore I, change the subject, will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit. So we saw that in the last chapter, right? Yeah, there it is. And you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Will you still say before him who slays you, I am a God? <laughs> but you shall be a man and not a God in the hand of him who slays you. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of Aliens. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Operation Blue Beam right there. For I have spoken, says the Lord God. Whew. That's pretty intense, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what? the so sinful man who finds himself secure in his sin mm -hmm. says God mm -hmm. is actually a man, and the sinful man who realizes his sin and repents. Right. Or is contrite in is made like God, actually forgiven. Well, I was I was thinking of uh, I think it was yeah, Psalm twenty two, I am a worm and not a man. Yeah. Worm and not a man. Right. Yeah, your heart is lifted up. That's interesting. 
Wow. So he thinks he sees... And this is common in the ancient world. It's not just the king of Tyre. Caesar thought the same thing of himself. Or at least that they acclaimed, right? You're not just... Caesar is God, right? That's why uh, the Pharisees try to use that against Jesus, right? And what did they say? We have no king but... Right, yeah. Right, but they try... They, they, it's, it's subtle. It's not explicit. It's implicit. And the accusation against Jesus is that, is that he has not only... Con- he's not only spoken blasphemy against the God of Israel but against the God of the Romans too. So look for that when you do the uh, passion reading again. It's like, oh, so by speaking against Caesar, he's, yeah. Which God of the Romans? Caesar, yeah. I mean, there were many Roman gods. Yeah, they don't name them in the New Testament. I don't even think they're suggested there for the most part. Huh. It's Caesar is the icon. It, but we talked about this with Moses. Moses was the representative of Yahweh. So to, Caesar was the representative of all the Roman gods? Correct, of the Pantheon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, but that's why they named places. They built temples to Caesar. Caesarea. Mm-hmm. Philippi. Yeah. It's named. Right. So. Caesarea. They created a different one for different reasons, like Mars was out of war. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it, it probably is more like demigod. Oh. You know, because he's a man, but he's also... Or maybe like the Dalai Lama today, who's kind of the head of state of Tibet, except there is no Tibet state. <laughs> and he's also a god, they say, or god, even though he's a man. Very confusing. Maybe I wonder where they got that idea. Anyway. Yeah, so anyway, he says, I am a god, one of many. I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas, right? So he's like with Poseidon, that's what I mentioned, or whoever the other god of the sea is. I've, they have a name for him. It's sort of the D, I think. There's a Phoenician one. I can't remember his name. Uh, yeah, this is again, the, word, the Lord God is saying this. You are a man and not a God, though you set your heart as the heart of a God. Right? And then there is some question about whether this parenthetical note here is sarcasm. I mean, he is wise, but he trusts in it. Um, he does have understanding. He does gain riches. He has gold and silver in his treasuries. Right? He has used his wisdom and trade to increase his riches. Right? And he, he does think of himself highly because of, you know, we, we have gold back currency, one, one to one, right? You know, and he trusts in all of that. But what good is it before God, the true God? Mm hmm. All right. So it's trying to be God in God's place. And this is the way that mammon works. This is even daily bread can be a temptation. You say, um, soul, I say to my soul, how's the parable go? You have riches stored up, right? Uh, and then Jesus comes along and says, what good is any of that to you when the, when the judge comes? <laughs> no, what a great reading for Thanksgiving Day. That's, it's Thanksgiving Day. Is that when I did it? Oh, it's the Harvest Festival? Yes. Okay. Yes, harvest festival. Soul, I said to my soul, I have riches stored up. See, it is. There's no God, right? Then you die. And what good were all your riches? Or as I joke, see it, Don. Uh, you don't see, you, you don't see, uh, what do you don't see behind a hearse? A U-Haul. Right? They don't, we're not Egyptians, right? Somebody said they wanted to be buried in their Corvette, though. Who was that? Here. Yeah, I think they might have been joking. I'm not sure. It's like, how many grape plots do you have to buy to have your, to be buried in your car? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's like the ancient Egyptians, right? When we uncover the tombs of the pharaohs and they've got, they've got all their stuff for, for the afterlife. Yeah, right. Or not, because it was stolen. So, again, what, do we, what happens to the one who trusts in all these things? God brings strangers against you, right? It's God who brings those against you to conquer you. So whatever we're experiencing as a country, I've been pointing out before, it's God's judgment against us. Right? Which means, who do we pray to for relief? God who afflicts us. Right? Wait, God's bringing the Russians and the Chinese against us? Yes. Because we trust in our nation, empire, currency, whatever it is that we're trusting in. Our leaders, I don't know why you do that, but oh well. What? We trust in Amazon? Right. 
The number one contractor f for the Department of Defense is Amazon. Even more than Raytheon, they get more money. Yeah, all the, all the Department of Defense data stored on Amazon servers. A little bit of Microsoft, but mostly Amazon. Yep. They shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom, defile. So now, remember we had, what, were the, what was the king wearing? Splendid garments, like a priest. And now look what's happening to him. He's being defiled. So we have a, there is a strong religious connotation here because he thinks of himself as God, as one to be worshipped. But as false gods are always, they're always end up defiled in their own estimation, thrown to the pit to die in the midst of the seas. All right. And then what are you going to say then? I love this bit, right? Well, what are you going to say to him who slays you? I am a god as you're dying. <laughs> That's like in 300. That's a movie. Uh, but you shall be a man and not a god in the hand who slays you. And then this interesting note. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of foreigners or aliens. Esther, Dorothy, Dorothy. Or, then just take her out so we can finish class. It's fine. You can watch it online. Um, die the, dying the death of the uncircumcised. Here's an interesting note. The people of Tyre and Sidon, they practice circumcision. Yeah. yeah just like the Jews and the Egypt. Right. So he's dying. The, take her out, please. Thank you. Um, dying the death of the uncircumcised would be as much an insult for a person of Tyre as it is for a Jew. Does that follow? Yeah. For I have spoken. All right, because they would be circumcised. They could, it's not the same thing, but they mimicked, apparently mimicked the people of Israel in this. All right, as a mark of circumcision. Did I put a note about that? I think I did. No. Yeah. Either circumcision originated with um, Abraham and then the Jews, or God used another pagan thing, like, like sacrifice to idols for his purpose. Right. So we probably should end it there. Um, let me just tidy things up here a little bit, though, because it's time. Um, <laughs> isn't it fun how the kids tell you? They're like, nope, that's, that's the limit. You've reached your limit. So what did I write here? Uh, pride resulting in downfall is clear. The details are not. Strong parallels, though, to the creation and to fall with the, and the high priestly vestments of Exodus 28. There are no parallel Phoenician myths uh, which are extent to suggest that Ezekiel is just repurposing some story of some ancient mariner king or something like that, right? Um, Yahweh inspired Ezekiel to compose this chapter, drawing on a wide range of earlier canonical scripture and tailoring it to the rhetorical needs of the situation. In other words, it's not, there's not a one, this happens sometimes with Bible people. They're like, oh, there's the flood, there's all these flood myths and look at how they're all similar. We don't have anything similar to this in Phoenician myth. All right. So, um, so it's here just as a judgment. It parallels Isaiah in Isaiah 14. It's almost the same kind of language, except there it's the king of Babylon, not the king of Tyre. All right. So it doesn't matter. The king is representative of earthly authority, and especially the the kind of earthly authority that men exercise to claim, claiming to be God in God's place. I am the science, you know, which is a statement of divinity. I am, I am knowledge. I am wisdom. Yeah. And what happens? They're personified. They fall, right? Like a meteorite, like the fall of Satan from heaven. You can read the text there. So the, I would suggest both Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, these two kings, the king of Babylon and the king of Tyre, are both embodiments of, of well, Satan or satanic you know, power authority within history. And they're all going to be judged, every king, right? Think of the psalmist. O kings be wise, O nations tremble, right? Because the Lord comes to judge. Of course, the, the primal sin is the cause of original sin, that first sin you know, wanting what was beautiful. And all children of Adam inherit that. Only Christ can redeem us from it. Here we're applying it to one sinner, the king of Tyre, as a violation of the first commandment. I am a God, and thus God's entire law, which is also true for all sin, right? Even one of God's greatest gifts, wisdom, can be used sinfully. Wisdom concerns the art of mastering life. Hence, many situations are possible. You can go read all the wisdom literature in Proverbs. 
But here the wisdom of Tyre's business acumen is used in extreme pride. Right? And pride, wisdom is supposed to be to learn of Christ ultimately and to receive his gospel. So all of this, the grave, going down to the dead, he's losing his crown, which is like his halo. He's going to be one of the uncircumcised, right? All because he trusted in his beauty, his wisdom, and I would guess his wealth, right? And that's what happens to the kings of this earth. So I, I find that comforting because, you know, there are people who are trying to do terrible things to us who consider themselves smarter than you uh, and have a better sense of beauty and also definitely wealthier than you and that they're going to do all these great and terrible things to you. You'll, you will have nothing and you'll be happy. Right? They're generally uh, communal kind of people, communists as we call them. Right? But what is God doing to, going to do to them? It doesn't mean that they won't rule for a time like the king of Tyre did. But ultimately, if not now, in, in eternity, they, they're judged, right? And their kingdoms fall. Why would, when Satan tempts Jesus, all these kingdoms could be yours. You know, in back of Jesus' mind, what is he thinking? Why would I want those worthless things? <laughs> they're, all, they're already judged, and I'm already judged them. They're not, they're not worthy of redemption. Why does that think that's even work? Because that's how we work. If he offered you... To be king of the world, you know, to quote Jack, would you take it? You know, we have we have stories about this. The devil went down to Georgia. What's another one? The cross, the different crossroads stories, right? You sell your soul to Satan, you know, and it's always the same thing: power, wealth, and what? Beauty, money, wealth. Yeah, it's always the same, and that's what. The king of Tyre fell into the sway, and then he ends up in the same place as Satan. <laughs> it was prepared for Satan as a result. So it's a warning, too, I suppose, to us as well. But also that this judgment will come. All right. We'll drop it there. We'll finish the rest of the chapter next time. So we'll pick up with this. Oh, there's plenty more things to talk about. Look, I had a whole back of the sheet. All right. Good. We'll do that. Happy Father's Day. Have a good day. Thanks for staying. Yeah, no, thank you.